wonder if we should go ahead and get started while people are still trickling in. Um, I, I'm really excited for us to have this session on colon cancer screening options during COVID-19. I know um, a lot of people have had questions about how this is all going to work. Um, and there's some you know, numbers coming out in the media about the impact of all this that are a little um, scary to think about. Um, but I am really excited on behalf of the Program for the Elimination of Cancer Disparities, our PCAG team, and the Colon Cancer Community Partnership to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Weiss. Uh, Dr. Weiss is Professor of Surgery, and he is Program Director of the General Surgery Residency um, here at WashU, um, as well as Director of the Inherited Colorectal Cancer and Polyposis Registry. So he does um, a lot of clinical work, a lot of first for um, for everyone, for patients and the community, and and definitely. Um, as a um, contributor to PCAD. So Dr. Weiss, I'll hand it over to you. And Marilyn and I will um, monitor the chat. Great. Thanks, Dr. James, I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> this will be a really open forum. So um, while I've got my slides showing, I won't be able to see things as well. So uh, definitely we'll have some folks monitoring the chat um, and, uh, there may be some times when we can have some audience participation and so I uh, may open the microphones up at that time, uh, let uh, people be able to speak up if they have questions and certainly we'll try to leave time at the end. Uh, I'm not just gonna focus on screening options during COVID. I wanna make sure we're all kind of starting at the same starting point in terms of our understanding about colorectal cancer, um, and what, what what kind of aspects of colorectal cancer are important to consider, not just in COVID times, but all the time, um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And so uh, a little bit of a um, uh, kind of spoiler, uh, we're, as things are ramping back up normally, we're kind of back to things being relatively normal for screening in the times of COVID. So had we been giving this talk a couple of months ago, it would be very different. Um, so. Uh, so the good news is, is screening, especially colonoscopies, are you're able to get it done. Granted, you have to jump through some hoops, but we'll talk about that. So um, in terms of uh, my disclosures, I have none that are related to this. I don't get any financial support uh, from any um, anything related to this talk. And um, I won't be talking about any particular products, but certainly some of you may have comments or questions about them, and I'm happy to offer my opinion if I have one uh, about any of the screening products uh, or approaches that are out there. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of background. Most of this is actually going to be background because I want to make sure again that we're all on the same page. We'll talk about the diagnosis and treatment of colorectal cancer briefly. I am a colorectal surgeon, uh, but I do do uh, colonoscopies, both screening as well as follow-ups uh, for cancers. And because of my interest in high risk, taking care of high risk patients, um, I do uh, scopes on those patients as well. Uh, I do want to focus a fair bit on prevention. It's actually, it's obviously at the heart of everything that we're trying to do at the Simon Cancer Center at Washington University, uh, Dr. James's group, uh, everyone around, we're trying to work on ways to make colorectal cancer a non-entity, uh, just like we are with cancer in general. And so we would love to focus on prevention. And obviously at the heart of prevention is screening. And so detecting things uh, before they ever have a chance to turn into a cancer is critical. And we will touch about on that uh, during COVID times. So um, a little bit about colorectal cancer estimates. It's an incredibly uh, common cancer. Unfortunately, it's uh, one of the most common cancers uh, that are out there. There's going to be around 150,000 new cases of colorectal cancer in the United States estimated for this year. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how those numbers are going down, but it's the second most common cause of cancer death uh, in um, the United States with uh, over 50,000 deaths anticipated uh, this year. Uh, as you will see that those deaths are um, uh, mainly focused in the older uh, age population, but we are seeing an increasing number in younger patients and we'll talk about that a little bit. 
but overall, the lifetime risk has gone down a bit with better screening. It used to be around 1 in 20, and so for men and women, it's about the same, but slightly uh, less risk in women, but about 1 in 25 women and 1 in 23 men uh, will suffer from colorectal cancer in their lifetimes. And that peaks at a later age. Um, and we do see a small subset that are happening at a younger age and, uh, and patients less than 40. Uh, but that increase starts as people get into their uh, 40s and then really starts to ramp up as, as folks get older. And that's why the screening recommendations are that folks start in their uh, 40s or 50s. And that has changed a little bit recently and we can talk about that as well. Um, the good news is overall, we're seeing since really since the 1980s, a uh, steady decline in both uh, the incidence of colorectal cancer in men and women and the mortality or deaths related to colorectal cancer. So not only are uh, we um, decreasing the development of colorectal cancer and stopping it before it has a chance to start, uh, but we're also doing a better job in treating those patients with colorectal cancer. Uh, and so that's the good news. Uh, breaking it down a little bit more, we're seeing that in pretty much all the age groups, both uh, those who are uh, age uh, 50 and above. So we're seeing that in the older age group, and these are the folks that have mainly been targeted for screening. Unfortunately, we're seeing this steady uptick in both men and women below the age of 50 uh, since really since the mid-90s. Um, and we, I'm happy to talk about that afterwards, but we're seeing a greater incidence as well as mortality. So it appears that not only are more people at a younger age getting colorectal cancer, um, but maybe those cancers are being diagnosed at a later stage or they're more aggressive or a combination of both. Um, now, I do want to point out that the scale on these are different. So you can see that the scale is much, much higher in older patients versus a little bit younger versus much younger. So um, this is still a small subset of the overall number of patients with colorectal cancer being diagnosed, but it has been alarming to many uh, folks, both within, um, uh, within public health uh, circles, as well as epidemiology circles, and uh, physicians who are taking care of these younger patients. You know, in the past, if somebody was young and they showed up with uh, blood in their stool, we'd say, ah, it's just hemorrhoids, don't worry about it. But we're seeing more and more patients at a younger age who are being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And so more, we're trying to make sure more physicians have colorectal cancer in their differential uh, when they're seeing patients with those kind of symptoms. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is uh, within the area uh, that Siteman Cancer Center takes care of patients, certainly within Missouri and Illinois, it's worth noting that both the incidence, which is in blue, so the number of patients being diagnosed, as well as uh, the death rates or mortality rates from colorectal cancer are higher than in the United States in general within Missouri and Illinois. And looking even more specifically at the, um, the catchment area for Siteman Cancer Center, uh, all the way from the boot heel up, uh, essentially along the entire uh, eastern border of Missouri and all of southern Illinois, uh, our, our incidence rates and mortality rates are even higher uh, than in the U.S. and in Missouri and Illinois in general. And so that's certainly concerning to us at, uh, here at Washington University and Siteman Cancer Center and Barnes Jewish Hospital that we're really trying to focus on how we can better identify and uh, prevent these uh, patients from getting colorectal cancer and certainly more advanced colorectal cancers um, since early cancer is very treatable. And so uh, I, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention, especially uh, given much of what we're seeing that's happening across the country culturally, to recognize that just as we've seen um, uh, populations of color being more significantly impacted by COVID and other health issues, that is most assuredly the case with colorectal cancer as well. And so in this example here uh, with black and African-American populations, uh, you notice that within our catchment center as well as um, uh, across uh, Missouri and Illinois, we see higher rates than uh, in the United States. And certainly blacks are impacted more than, uh, than whites in terms of uh, both incidence and mortality. Uh, and there are many uh, issues that are leading to this. Certainly there is the potential for uh, more ag aggressive biology in certain subsets of patients, but clearly access to care um, and other, um, uh, other health issues that impact people's uh, ability to get care 
as well as uh, survive when they get colorectal cancer are significant. And uh, the folks within the public health groups here within the Department of Surgery, as well as uh, across the institution, have really tried to focus on, on uh, these issues, uh, which are clearly uh, significant, as we've seen on multiple levels, uh, and so something concerning to us as well. Uh, it's because of this that some uh, institutions and groups have recommended younger ages for uh, screening to start in, uh, in um, groups of color, especially in African American populations, because of these uh, numbers that you're seeing here. Well, what are the symptoms from colorectal cancer? And this is regardless of your gender, it's regardless of your uh, background or uh, uh, racial makeup. This is, um, this is for all groups. Um, and how, how, do they, how do those symptoms show up? And the reality is it depends to some degree on where the tumor is, uh, because if you have a rectal cancer, you may feel more pressure down there, you may have more mucus or blood, uh, but a, uh, a cancer that's uh, up higher in the large intestine, in the colon, um, may cause uh, more, may present more with bleeding symptoms. Uh, you could have blockage symptoms uh, no matter where the uh, cancer potentially is. And so there are times when we have people show up with pretty dramatic symptoms um, that maybe they had symptoms that they uh, had somehow or other been able to disregard or uh, the symptom just hit them all of a sudden. And uh, obviously that can require emergency surgery and emergency procedures to try to diagnose and treat those patients. But more often the, the symptoms tend to be a little bit more subtle. Uh, folks may uh, see a little bit of blood in their stool or they may just show up with uh, low blood counts or anemia uh, related to a slow kind of trickle of blood from the tumor in the intestines. Uh, they may notice some subtle changes to their bowel habits, problems with constipation or more frequent loose stools, uh, kind of slowly increasing abdominal pain, unexpected weight loss, uh, or as I mentioned, if they have a tumor in the rectum, they may notice pain or pressure there that's uh, persistent. So it can come up with a number of different symptoms, but as you expect, it depends where it is in the intestines that it may have an impact on that. Um, well, what about staging? Um, so when someone is uh, initially presents with symptoms and then they get diagnosed, uh, usually with a colonoscopy to confirm uh, that they have that, uh, what's the next step that we have to think about? And that's uh, staging. And staging can be related to a physical exam. It can be related to particular labs that we check. It can also be related to different types of scans. And I won't get into this in, in, in depth because this is a whole other talk unto itself about how to stage folks. But the reason why we do staging is because it really helps us uh, to determine prognosis and someone's uh, likely outcomes, but that also then helps us to determine treatment uh, for patients uh, and whether or not we should go straight to surgery or consider other uh, treatment options for them. Um, and what's important, obviously, about staging is, is if we catch the tumor early, so if it's, uh, if it's a local stage uh, and it hasn't spread outside of the colon or rectum itself, hasn't spread to lymph nodes, hasn't spread to other organs, the likelihood of, of someone surviving uh, uh, the diagnosis and treatment is very, very high. Uh, but as soon as the tumor starts to spread a little bit further, that uh, rate starts to drop significantly, especially if the tumor has spread uh, to other organs. And so that's when we're really fighting an uphill battle for patients. And the good news is we have lots of really um, impressive and expanding treatment options that have been very successful for a lot of patients. But still, it's, it's scary when you're faced with a diagnosis to begin with, but then if the tumor is more advanced at the time that it's been detected, um, the likelihood that we'll be able to cure someone is much less. And so that's obviously scary for the patients and their family and, and us as well. So it means we have a, a lot bigger fight. And so ideally we wanna to try to diagnose uh, people, we wanna prevent the cancer from happening in the first place, but if someone does have a cancer, we want it to be diagnosed at an early stage before it becomes symptomatic or has been able to spread. And uh, let me know if there are any questions, you can certainly put those in the chat if there's any questions that have come up. So there is a question in the chat about whether um, their data on um, infant mortality within the Native American community. So I had a little bit of hard time saying what you were saying there, Amy. Um, understand what you're saying. Let me see if I can find the chat itself. Yeah. Apologize. I heard something about mortality and. Um, in, in Native American communities. Oh, in Native American communities. Yeah, it's yeah. the same. I would say in, in, any, um, in any minority communities that we've seen, um, uh, the, 
um, especially folks that are diagnosed um, uh, or folks that are at higher risk, whether it's related to family history or others, um, that we have noticed higher rates of uh, mortality uh, in that. I don't offhand, I have to admit, know the incidence rates in Native American uh, communities because we don't have a particularly high uh, population uh, that has been treated here. Um, and so I, I apologize, I don't know the answer to the incidence rates uh, within Native American communities, but I do know that the mortality rates are much higher just as they are with pretty much all health issues in uh, Native American communities. Because while we have a good public health service, uh, still access to care within those communities is quite poor. Um, and so um, that, that much I do know. Um, all right, so we'll, um, I'll move on here and talking about treatment. Now I'm a surgeon, so I, I love to operate and uh, I can't say that at least, you know, right now surgery is the only real curative option for colorectal cancer, but that's actually been changing. And so we're seeing a lot of other treatment options that have been curative for patients, which is great news. Um, so that if they're able to avoid an operation, especially if that operation may require them to have a permanent ostomy bag, obviously uh, folks would like, love it if they can avoid surgery altogether. And so our goal is to have a multidisciplinary approach to have uh, you know, radiation oncologists and medical oncologists and surgeons and pathologists and radiologists and everyone getting together to try to take uh, complete care of, of a patient. So uh, when we talk about one of the other treatment options, that's chemotherapy. And that's really uh, used for keeping the cancer from coming back after surgery. So if someone had a more advanced cancer that we were able to take out and we wanna minimize the likelihood if the horse had gotten out of the barn and we've just taken the barn out, we wanna make sure if there are little horses running around, the chemotherapy can treat, treat those horses. Uh, but sometimes if we can't do surgery, if the tumor's already too advanced and there are too many horses out of the barn, it doesn't make sense for us to go in and expose the patient to the risk of taking um, the primary tumor out, especially if it's not causing significant symptoms, uh, that uh, we would, in, in doing that, we would end up causing problems, maybe uh, delay their ability to get treatment. Um, that would be, that would be a, a big problem for them. And so uh, sometimes we'll do it to try to render the patient able to get surgery. So uh, kind of go after the horses and the barn all at the same time, so to speak. Um, and, and certainly that's in the case if the cancer has spread. Um, so sometimes if the uh, tumor is more advanced, we may have to use chemotherapy to try to shrink it and make it so we can do surgery. Um, and I will say that uh, many of you heard about personalized medicine and there's things about immunotherapy and many different treatments that are out there. I'm not an oncologist, so I can't speak um, in detail about a lot of those agents, but there's been some amazing treatments that are uh, have come Come, uh, uh, become available over the last uh, few years um, that I have seen have dramatic effects on patients who otherwise had very advanced cancers. And so these are very exciting things. We can do particular tests on individuals' tumors and may find a uh, treatment that allows us to specifically target their tumor uh, with dramatic results. And so that's very exciting. Um, Radiation is something you hear about, mainly related to rectal cancer. We don't usually use this for colon cancer. Some very advanced colon cancers, we may have to use it, um, but usually it's just for rectal cancer. Uh, it's pretty standard for the treatment of rectal cancer, and we actually are seeing with some of the techniques that we're using now um, uh, that we can actually shrink the tumors and sometimes make them completely go away. And so non-operative treatments for rectal cancer is something that we've been uh, pushing the envelope on for a while now. Uh, because it's more likely that if someone has a rectal cancer, they would need to have a, a, a permanent ostomy bag uh, if we have to do surgery. And so finding ways to avoid that is something that we've been focused on. And usually I will admit that uh, radiation is done in concert with chemotherapy to try to kind of have a multi-prong uh, approach to treat, treat the cancer and hopefully cure it. All right, so here's a little comment about, uh, about colon cancer. This is what I like to do, of course, when we're telling the patient that the operation was a success, but now their colon is a semicolon at that point. So shifting gears a little bit, I wanna talk about uh, prevention. And so this is at the heart of what uh, Dr. James and a number of folks are doing at, uh, at Washington University and within uh, public health to try to see if there are ways that we can really get at the heart of prevention. And so um, one thing, and we'll see if uh, folks want to be involved maybe within the chat, um, uh, what are some risk factors that can't be changed related to colorectal cancer risk? So any, anything that anyone can come up with, you can either unmute and make some comments or, um, or put in the chat box, are there, are there 
um, uh, are there risk factors that can't be changed? So I'll bring up the chat. Age, perfect. Family history, that's great. That is absolutely right. So age is probably the biggest one, right? And I showed that earlier. I mean, the fact that um, that your uh, age is what um, d seems to be most related to colorectal cancer risk. And so that is that is absolutely a, a, a big one that's there. Um, whether you yourself have had prior polyps or a cancer, uh, patients who've had their own personal history of colorectal cancer or polyps, it seems whatever it is that led to their first polyps or cancer uh, can lead to subsequent polyps or cancer. And so we know that if you've had polyps cancer before, um, we need to be a little bit more vigilant with you. And that's why the recommendation is um, if you have a colonoscopy and we find polyps, instead of waiting the usual 10 years for a repeat colonoscopy, perhaps we may say five years or three years instead. Family history, that was mentioned and absolutely right. So uh, for the same reason that, um, that you yourself, if you've had problems before, might be at increased risk, having relatives, blood relatives, uh, who also have uh, risk may suggest that perhaps there's a gene in the family that's putting people at increased risk or, you know, families tend to have similar exposures. So, um, you know, you may see more smoking in a family, you may see more drinking, you may see uh, same similar diet patterns uh, in families uh, and even screening patterns. They, if, if some family members say they refuse to get screened, other family members may uh, also jump on that bandwagon. So they're probably um, real issues with families, both genetic and behavioral, that impact those risks. Uh, certainly something that I'm interested in is hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes that put people at incredibly increased risk of, of getting a colorectal cancer. And so that's a clear genetic phenomenon, uh, genetic reason for people to get it. But other conditions can put you at increased risk. So patients with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis have increased risk for colorectal cancer as well. And why those patients have to get more frequently screened uh, over time, because the longer they've had it, the higher their rate risk may be of getting a colorectal cancer. Certainly there are some relationships with ethnic and racial backgrounds. I mentioned earlier about higher rates in African-Americans, um, but we do see uh, also in certain groups like Ashkenazi Jews and other groups that have uh, increased uh, genetic risk uh, of getting colorectal cancer. And so some of those groups may be recommended to start screening early or have screening more frequently done. So yeah, so we'll talk about some of the dietary things here in a little bit. Uh, when we talk about some of the other risk factors, and hopefully I can answer that question about, uh, about diet. So this is something that I'm interested in, and um, we mentioned the fact that, um, that there are some hereditary cancers that put, or hereditary syndromes that put people at increased risk. And so in the kind of big pie of colorectal cancer risk, the majority of patients are ones who may not have any obvious risk factors or minimal risk factors. They're sporadic colorectal cancers, and that's probably about 70%. Um, there are some families that have high risks. It seems like there are a number of family members that get colorectal cancer or polyps, but we can't find a gene in those families. That's probably a sign that we just haven't, our technology hasn't figured it out yet. Um, but it, there certainly are, um, the hope is, is that we'll find that out in the future. We're finding more and more genes that are related to slightly increased risk of colorectal cancer. And that's probably what these cases are from. And then the really high risk syndromes that we see uh, would be next. So these are things you can't change. Obviously, you can't change your family history um, and your um, genes. Uh, but here's kind of an example of how it can impact things. So uh, a little bit busy here, but hopefully you can follow me that if you have no family history and this bar should go up to one, let's say that's your the baseline risk. But as soon as you have a relative who's had a precancerous polyp or a primary relative, you know, brother, sister, parent, or child, who's had colorectal cancer, your risk is two to two and a half times greater of getting colorectal cancer. As soon as you have a young primary relative, someone who's uh, young when they're diagnosed, that rate goes up to like four times. And if you have multiple primary relatives with colorectal cancer, it goes up even higher. So you're getting higher and higher risks the more relatives you have. So clearly there are genetic factors um, that, that weigh on uh, your risk of colorectal cancer. So if you haven't had a polyp or cancer, but many members of your family have, you're, at, you're definitely at increased risk without a doubt. So um, 
So what are some things that can be changed? So there's a comment there about environmental pollution. So maybe where you live uh, and exposures that you have. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion about that, um, how just by pe where people live and maybe where they're forced to live due to socioeconomic pressures, you know, they can't afford to go live in a safer neighborhood or a neighborhood that's not exposed to environmental pollution. So a lot has been coming out about um, how many disadvantaged groups, especially uh, people of color, are kind of forced to live in areas where they may have higher exposures. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, how about other things that can be changed? Anything else people want to mention or put in the chat about things that can be changed to affect your risk? Smoking and drinking, absolutely. Diet, absolutely. So, and, and Marilyn, you'd asked a question about diet and we'll talk about that, but I think diet's a big one. Now that's been a little bit controversial here. There've been some discussions about that um, and concerns about it, but smoking definitely is related. Um, alcohol, especially um, uh, higher amounts. Um, exercise, 100%, and sedentary behavior is actually very interesting because we know that obesity is, re is uh, related to, especially in women, um, uh, there's a higher risk of colorectal cancer. But interestingly enough, even if you're not obese, but you have a relatively sedentary lifestyle, uh, that may increase your risk. So there are many theories about like, well, the younger generation, they sit around and just game all day, right? So that's a great bias that people have had. But uh, that maybe that stereotype, is it possible that that's impactful? We're all sitting at our desks all day, um, you know, on computers. Is it possible that that's impacting those risks? And so certainly, whether you're obese or not, if you have, if you're thin but sit around, you have a higher risk uh, than if uh, than if you're thin and uh, active. So there's definitely an impact there. And then type two diabetes, interestingly enough, even if you separate out the obesity and other factors, has been uh, implicated in risking in the risk of colorectal cancer, and then where you live, and that is uh, alludes to what I mentioned earlier, not just where you live on the globe, but areas uh, within. Um, uh, particular cities and, and certainly out in the community. And we talked about how our catchment area for Siteman Cancer Center has higher rates than in other parts of our states and in the country. And so it, it's certainly there are subsets of populations that are clearly more impacted than others, uh, perhaps related to access to care, access to appropriate screening techniques, um, and obviously with other health issues and exposures, they're at higher risk, and it may be related to diet, smoking, uh, alcohol as well. So it's probably multiple factors that influence folks in that way. And obviously, if you already have uh, genes that put you at higher risk, you add all these factors into it, and it skyrockets your risk of getting colorectal cancer, and therefore you really have to participate in screening to make sure you can avoid that cancer. And then there has been a fair bit of discussion recently about the microbiome. So we all have bacteria in our intestines that are helping us to digest. And so the question is, is do different types of bacteria influence our risk? And there's actually been a lot of exciting research that's been done here as well as other uh, institutions across the country that are suggesting that that probably has an influence. So it may be the combination of diet and uh, the um, digestive bacteria that you have that may be influencing that. The question is, is can you change the bacteria in your colon and influence your risk? And that's not clear yet. Um, whether or not if you take a probiotic, would that potentially impact your risk? And, and we don't know yet. So here's an example of how, uh, you know, there's certainly parts of the world where there are increased risk. We certainly have a lot of risks as well as in Australia. Uh, there are risks across Europe and Russia. As you get to other uh, parts of the world, probably related to diet and other exposures, uh, those risks are, uh, are much lower. And so uh, there are probably a lot of uh, protective factors. We do know that if people live in an area where colorectal cancer risk is low, uh, where in general, um, people maybe not even have to be going through screening because it's such a low risk. If they move to areas like, say, the United States, uh, where the risks are much higher and they start to adopt our eating habits and our uh, behaviors, uh, their risks go back up. So within a generation of somebody's family moving from an area where it's a low risk to, uh, say, the United States, where it's a higher risk, all of a sudden they have equaled our, our rates. So certainly where you live and the kind of environmental exposures you have, uh, whether it's diet, smoking, et cetera, uh, influences that without a doubt. Uh, the other thing, and this has been something that's been more controversial is about red meat consumption. I, I think most of us agree that certainly processed meats and processed foods do put you at increased risk. 
um, and probably some of the chemicals that are in there. And certainly we see more processed foods than ever before. Maybe that's another reason why we're seeing younger people get uh, colorectal cancer because they're exposed to these processed foods at a younger age. These are all theories and we're not 100% sure yet, but certainly in countries where you see higher rates of meat consumption, and this is cancer incidence in women. Um, and obviously this is older data from the 1970s, but it's been reproduced that when you have, uh, based on uh, the amount of uh, meat that they have per capita, uh, gives you an idea about the colorectal cancer, the colon cancer uh, risk. So just an example of potentially how that's influenced. There are a lot of ways that you can actually go in and assess your own risk of colorectal cancer and how worried you should be uh, and whether or not you need to increase your surveillance. And so I think one that um, our institution is incredibly proud of and the folks within the uh, Division of Public Health within the Department of Surgery, Dr. Koldis, Dr. James, others have worked on this, um, where they, you can look at both disease risk in general, but also col all the different types of cancers in specific. And so if you go to the Siteman Cancer website, there are ways to um, not only assess your risk, but also look at ways to prevent. So they give you ways that you can consider trying to prevent cancer. But there are other ones uh, within, if you go to yourdiseaserisk.org or cancer.gov, there are risk calculators that are there that take big, big patient population information and try to uh, distill that down to ways that you can put in your particular information. And these are not, they don't collect the data. You don't have to put your name or any other identifying things. You can just put in, you know, very generic information about you and it'll come back and tell you, are you at higher risk? Are you at average risk? Are you at low risk? Um, and it can be very informative to help you decide about your own screening and maybe even help your care provider um, to, to know how you should be getting screened and how, how aggressive you need to be. So these can be very helpful, both to prevent as well as to identify your risks. So what are some other things about ways to prevent? So we, we've kind of alluded to this a little bit, but I'll talk about it more. So healthy diet, I think there was a question about whether or not if you are at higher risk, so let's say you've had polyps or other things before, can you change your diet and maybe decrease your risk? And, and the suggestion is yes. So let's say you, you, know, you grew up eating like you know, bologna and hot dogs and bacon and uh, sausage and you know, steaks and hamburgers, and that was your main uh, consumption. If you change your diet, uh, can you decrease your risk? And the thought is yes. And even in patients who have high risk with really strong family histories, um, there's evidence that if you try to eat a, a better diet and have a better lifestyle, uh, that you can even, you can almost kind of not defeat the genes, but you can lower the risk that those genes pose. So uh, maybe it's taking away things that would trigger those genes to cause uh, cancer in somebody otherwise. Uh, certainly losing weight and staying active is really important. Um, quitting smoking if you're a smoker, avoiding heavy alcohol use, uh, all things in moderation. There's been some data that suggest that even, you know, used to, they used to say, oh, that one glass of wine, that red wine is great. It's got chemicals in it that help to minimize um, cancer risk. But there's been some debate about that a little bit more recently. And so really, I think if you're able to abstain altogether, that would be ideal. But again, all things in moderation. Um, you know, we, we don't tell people to go shelter themselves in a bubble and don't do anything that's fun. Um, but you just have to be thoughtful about doing too much fun. So. Um, there's been a little bit more controversy about daily aspirin, <clears throat> especially when it's related to heart disease. And so I definitely recommend that folks talk to their primary care doctors. But there is evidence that if you have higher risk in your family, that by you taking an aspirin, even a baby aspirin a day, that can decrease your risk of colorectal cancer. So the recommendations for patients who've had heart attack or stroke is that they do take an aspirin. But uh, in healthier patients, it used to be you said take a daily aspirin to prevent that but it may increase your risk of intestinal bleeding. So definitely talk to your primary care doctor about that because um, in some people, the risk may be uh, more than the benefit. Uh, but for patients who are at high risk for colorectal cancer, it, it's probably worth it to take an aspirin a day. And in some of my really high risk patients, we do recommend it. Um, there is some consideration of some supplements like say uh, vitamin D is one uh, that's significant, it's calcium, folate, magnesium. I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, but it's worth talking to your primary uh, care provider about whether or not taking a supplement is, is worth consideration. And then most importantly, by far, is following the screening recommendations. There's nothing that's been shown to be better to prevent colorectal cancer. All these behavioral things are, are very important and a key part. Uh, but 
following screening recommendations is the most important. So, so to some degree, I've now kind of hit you with all the background. Let's talk a little bit about uh, prevention and um, then we'll talk about prevention and screening within COVID times. So let's talk about the detection part of things and how uh, 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 physicians and, and nurse practitioners and PAs and other care providers uh, can help you to uh, hopefully uh, identify early if you have a cancer, but uh, God forbid, hopefully we can prevent it from happening in the first place. So why do we even do it? So the interesting thing, uh, screening for colorectal cancer is one of the few things where we can actually prevent the cancer from happening. So breast cancer screening is trying to identify the breast cancer early. Prostate cancer screening is trying to identify the prostate cancer early. Many of them are trying to identify the cancers at an early stage, but this is one where we can actually prevent a cancer from ever happening. And so that's something that's really nice about colorectal cancer screening uh, is that we can prevent it because the majority of cancers start as a polyp and that polyp grows over years. It's a very slow process uh, for most people and then turns into a cancer. Um, and so the hope is if we can stop the polyp, we can stop the cancer. And there's been great evidence over many decades to confirm that if you do a colonoscopy and remove a polyp, you can prevent a cancer from happening. And so, so here kind of as a cartoon example of that, your normal colon starts to get, a, you know, the cells start to get a little wacky and start to grow a little bit extra and kind of pile on top of each other. And then that turns into what's called an adenoma. That's another name for a precancerous polyp. And then that eventually turns into a cancer and that starts to grow. And this we think takes probably eight, 10, 15 years for that entire process to happen. And so if we can stop it at this stage, this stage won't happen. Yeah. So, um, and the scary thing is that a lot of times these polyps and early cancers are asymptomatic. People don't know they have them. So trying to identify them can be difficult and get rid of them. And so that's why colonoscopy has become the gold standard because we can look at the entire lining of the colon and take the polyps and tumors out. But it's been very clearly shown that lots of different approaches can help to uh, eliminate cancers and uh, save lives. And so uh, that, that's why screening has been found to be very cost effective, that you gotta do something to get screened to make sure that you don't develop the polyp or cancer uh, and hopefully prevent everything. So, but when to start your screening and how frequently it should be done is really based on your personal and family uh, risk factors and that's how we determine it. Now we'd love to see a map that showed 100% of people are getting screening. So this is colorectal cancer screening, a percentage of people in adults, and this is 50 years or older. And now this is listed in 2014. It's kind of data that was gathered from 2017 to 2019. And you can see here that across the country, really the highest rates are like getting up into the 75% range. And so there are only some states across the country. We're in the kind of mid 60s in Missouri and in the uh, lower 60s in, in Illinois. But that tells you only a, like really less than two thirds of the population are actually getting appropriately screened. So there's lots of folks who were missing here. And the, the goal is to try to get everybody uh, to do some type of screening. And so we'll talk about the details of that. So what are the options for tests? So there's two different kinds of tests that you can get done to screen for colorectal cancer. There are some that are required check in the poop. You're basically doing stool tests. And these are the ones you think about, like, you know, the doctor does a finger exam and wipes it on the card. Um, you know, frequently GYNs will do that at the time of a pelvic exam, or if you're getting a prostate check, they'll do that. That's not considered an adequate screening test. Um, so really it's either getting stool samples uh, and some of them require you got to send your entire poop, which you can imagine how attractive that is, to send that in um, to get it tested. And so especially the DNA tests, so you hear about Cologuard and some of the others, those you have to send in actually a bunch of poop to be able to test that. Some of the other ones that are looking for blood or blood products uh, are uh, these immunochemical tests. Those usually require a smear uh, of stool and um, sometimes they require multiple tests to be sure, um, but stool tests are one. The other one are structural tests and those are the ones like doing colonoscopies or sigmoidoscopies or CT scans um, or barium enemas. And those give us a structural look at the colon uh, to look and they're much better to help us identify polyps. So the first type of test really focuses mainly on identifying cancers. They can sometimes identify polyps, usually bigger polyps, um, but not as good as identifying small polyps. 
whereas the structural tests do a better job at identifying polyps, especially colonoscopy uh, is one that's better at identifying both polyps and cancers. So the stool tests tended to identify cancers, the structural tests tend to identify polyps and cancers. Uh, so there is a little bit of overlap, but just kind of in general. So those are the two main types of tests, structural and stool tests, and those help us to identify polyps and cancer variably depending. So a little bit more colonoscopy. Um, it has been clearly shown to significantly decrease the incidence of colorectal cancer. So by getting rid of those polyps, the cancer rates go down and a significant decrease in mortality. So um, deaths from colorectal cancer has clearly been shown. And that this does, if you haven't had one before, um, you have to do a full bowel prep, which is by far the worst part about it. Uh, and most people usually get some type of sedation during the procedure. Now we more frequently see uh, almost full anesthesia sometimes is given to help keep people comfortable during the procedure and help facilitate it. We use a lighted scope, uh, as you can see here, uh, that has some dials that allow us to get through this twisty, turny colon, um, allows us to see there. We can take pictures, we can do remove things, uh, we can uh, treat bleeding. There are other things that we can do with it uh, to treat it, but if we see a polyp, we can remove it, and that prevents that cancer uh, from forming. This does obviously take time away from work and you have to have access to it if you don't have uh, the ability to get to the doctor's office uh, to do this procedure, then it's probably not I ideal as an approach. Um, uh, so there are certainly uh, downsides to it. This is one of the more uh, risky procedures though, so you can certainly cause damage to the colon. Uh, perforation rates, a need for emergency surgery are very, very low, but they're not zero. Uh, there are risks of, of getting sedation. Those risks are very low. There is a risk probably close to around 5% of missing um, polyps. They could be hiding behind a fold, or if someone didn't do a good bowel prep, you may miss it. Uh, and it's certainly not cheap. Uh, it is it can be expensive depending on where you're getting it and what procedure is done. Um, uh, you know, probably at least five to six hundred dollars at least. And some places, you know, will charge thousands of dollars for these procedures. Um, and uh, it should be covered by uh, reasonable insurance. But there are some insurance plans that if you It'll cover screening, but it won't cover diagnostic. It's, it gets really sticky sometimes. And obviously it has to be available. You have to be able to access it um, and be able to get to it. Now, if you, have a, if you have a normal risk and a normal colonoscopy, it needs to be done every 10 years. But if you have family history uh, or you yourself have had prior polyps, that may get adjusted. And we can talk about that if people have questions. Now, something over the last uh, couple of decades that's come out is called a virtual colonoscopy. And a lot of people have gotten very excited about this. It's a way of using a CT scanner to actually look at your colon. Uh, now, people get excited about it because they think, oh, goody, I don't have to do a bowel prep. Unfortunately, as of right now, you do. Now, there are agents you can drink to try to kind of cancel out the stool so that the computer processor can... Uh, eliminate that, but it can do a nice job of finding polyps in there. And here's here's what this polyp looked like on colonoscopy, but here's what it looked like on the CT scan. And so it it really did show up quite nicely. Uh, this slightly more concerning polyp uh, that was able to be removed. Now, of course, as you can tell, if we see something on the CT scan, uh, and you do have to have a tube put in your bottom and air put in there, and you got to roll around on the scanner and get multiple shots. So it's not quite the panacea we'd hoped it would be. If they see something, then you have to go in for a colonoscopy. Now, the hope is if you've done the bowel prep and they see something that's abnormal, you can go in immediately and get the colonoscopy so you don't have to do another bowel prep. Um, but there is the potential that that can't be arranged. So, so this isn't, hasn't been perfect. And it's, uh, while it's mentioned as a screening potential, it's, it still has a little ways to go. Some insurance companies won't cover this. Uh, I'll usually use this as an alternative if a patient cannot get a colonoscopy for some reason. This is a, is a potential alternative for some patients. The other one that has gotten a lot of press recently, and you see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of ads on TV about it, are things like Cologuard and other agents that are out there, stool DNA tests. And so these are quite good at actually finding cancer. They're almost as good as colonoscopy in some settings. Uh, but they're not as good for finding polyps. They're about 40% effective in finding polyps. There are a number of false positives. So you'll get the test, it'll come back as positive, you get sent for a colonoscopy and we can't find anything. And that can get people very anxious. 
Do I have a cancer that's hiding somewhere and the doctors can't find it? Uh, do we end up having to do even more tests? How frequently should we do their tests now because we've had this test that we think is a false positive, but is it? Um, so it can be very nerve wracking and the cost can be quite high. So um, so for some insurance companies, if they don't cover this, uh, you're looking at a $600 bill for one test. Um, and so that's, that's pretty pricey. So most people usually, uh, especially within community practices, will use um, the uh, blood smear tests where you're sending in multiple stool samples. Uh, you don't have to send the whole stool, but just a smear of it to test for blood or blood products. And those, if they're used correctly, are very, very effective, maybe just as effective, if not more so than this. Uh, this, as I mentioned, you have to send your entire stool in, uh, whereas the other ones are, are getting smears. Um, and so as of right now, the Colgard was the only one that was approved in the United States. I do believe that there are a few others that are in the pipeline uh, as potential ones. And maybe when others are out there, the cost of these will go down. Uh, so I think it's definitely a great tool to have, but it's not perfect uh, and it's obviously expensive. So, so in general, there have been a number of task forces that have come together and tried to say, what's the best way to approach this? Is one test better than the other? And so usually they recommend the structural tests if the resources are available and the patient is willing and able to go through it. But if not, then it's probably better to do some of the other screening tests, whether the stool tests are probably a reasonable way to approach it to at least trigger people to see whether or not they absolutely need to have a colonoscopy. And a lot of community health centers out there do use those other stool tests as an initial screening test to see if someone should go through a colonoscopy. So it may be a good way to avoid having to have a colonoscopy unless it looks like it's truly, truly needed um, uh, because of the issues that are related to it. But there are advantages to those stool tests and that can be very help, helpful. So uh, the cost comparison between the CT scans colonoscopy. Yeah, so that's a great question. It also depends on the institution. Uh, the CT scanner tends to be a little bit, the scan itself tends to be less, but the radiologist to review it and read it, and then the potential of having to have a colonoscopy on top of that. Uh, ultimately, obviously, if you colonoscopy versus a CT and then a colonoscopy, clearly that's more expensive. Um, but just the two of them, probably the colonoscopy is a bit more expensive, depending on where you're getting it done and how much the radiologists charge uh, to get that procedure done and how much it's covered by insurance. So it's good to check with both your primary care provider as well as your insurance company to see, because if, if you have to pay for the entire CT scan out of pocket and you're still having to do the bowel prep and you still have to have a tube put in your bottom and air put in there um, uh, and, and you're exposed to the risk of radiation. It's a small risk, but it is a risk. And then of course they could find other things on the CT scan, not just in your colon that might require even more tests. So um, the rate of finding significant concerning findings on a CT colonography is less than 5%. So there's probably around a 3% chance of finding something that might be actionable. Um, and again, a lot of insurance companies won't cover it. So if insurance company will cover a colonoscopy, but they won't cover the CT scan, your out-of-pocket costs will be a whole lot higher with the CT scan uh, than it would be with the colonoscopy. So uh, are there any resources that will cover the cost if you don't have insurance, you can't pay for it? Yeah, so we actually have a grant uh, within uh, our department uh, through both, uh, there are two different groups. The Colon Cancer Alliance has uh, provided funds to help support folks who are uninsured or underinsured. Uh, there is a process that you have to go through to, to confirm that. Uh, and the American Cancer Society also through Affinia and some of the other community uh, health organizations also has tried to find ways to help cover patients who are uninsured or underinsured. I usually recommend that they go through the standard screening tests, the stool studies first, but certainly if they have family risks or other higher risks that don't make those appropriate tests and getting a colonoscopy is the best one, we do have options for that um, uh, that can potentially help cover folks. So again, you have to jump through some hoops to confirm the financial need, but once you've done that, we can help uh, try to get those procedures covered uh, so that folks don't get stuck with a, with a big bill because we recognize how incredibly important this is. So when should you start? Ask your primary care provider. That's the most important thing. But the average rate now is the recommendation standard is age 50. Now, interestingly, I put 45 in question mark. The American Cancer Society recently came, out, recently came out because of the increasing rates in younger people, recently came out and said, you need to, you should, we should consider doing this at age 45. But the insurance companies and all the other task forces haven't pushed for that yet. 
Um, but because of the younger ages, there has been a push to consider doing it at age 45. And there have been some groups that recommend age 45 for African-American and other higher risk groups. Um, and so, uh, so something to consider. I suspect we'll see in the next few years that that number will be lowered down to 45. If you're at high risk, you definitely want to ask because you may be needing to start your colonoscopies at age 20, age 25, uh, and getting them much more frequently. Uh, if you're at moderate risk, meaning you've got some family history, uh, maybe you've got a, a relative, maybe your parent had it, uh, and so you would start 10 years younger than they were or at age 40, whichever is younger. So let's say you had a parent that had colorectal cancer at age 45, you should get your first colonoscopy at age 35, <clears throat> and you may then get it every five years instead of every 10 years. So those are kind of the moderate risks. So it's definitely important to talk to your primary care provider. So yes, there are other associated uh, cancers that are associated with higher risk. Endometrial cancer is especially one that's known to be um, uh, related to a higher risk of colorectal cancer. Um, both so if as a woman you've had endometrial cancer, you definitely wanna make sure that you're getting uh, colorectal cancer screening. Breast cancer and prostate cancer, because they're so common in women and men respectively, have not been as associated, but there are some conditions that might associate it with it. So it's definitely worthwhile. I, I don't just ask about family history of colorectal cancer, I ask about all cancers to see, because sometimes I've seen families that have like, say high incidence of endometrial cancer in multiple generations, that's uterine cancer, by the way, um, that has me concerned that they might be at higher risk, so yeah. Um, so here's kind of a list of the tests. So, um, so colonoscopy every 10 years, these are ones, these are those structural tests. You can do barium enemas, CT colonography, that's the virtual colonography every five years. <clears throat> the flexible sigmoidoscopy just looks at the left colon. I think I, I haven't done this for screening in quite a while because we're seeing an increased rate in right-sided colon cancers. So colon cancer is over on the part where the sigmoidoscopy wouldn't get to. So I think if you're going to go through the procedure, I recommend the colonoscopy over the sigmoidoscopy. And then, of course, the other tests that are down below. Now, the stool DNA test has now been recommended to be done every three years. <clears throat> and given the costs of it, if you compare the costs of getting that done at least three times in the course of a decade versus the colonoscopy, it's probably more cost effective to do a colonoscopy than to do the stool DNA test every three years. Again, it depends on insurance and insurance coverage if you have it. And then the other stool tests are recommended annually uh, to be done. This is not a good way to do colorectal cancer screening, just so you know, not a good way. All right, so finally got to the heart of the question. So what about um, testing in, in the time of COVID? So, the CDC has told us that, um, yes, in fact, the virus has been found in, uh, in feces, has been found in stool in some patients with colorect, uh, with, who've had COVID, and that can even last for weeks afterwards. Now, the question is, is that virus like able to, to infect others? And we don't know the answer to that. We think it's a very low likelihood that it's able to infect others, and that's based on some of the other viruses similar, the other types of coronavirus that have been out there like SIRS and MARS and others that have been out there, those seem to have a very low likelihood. So we, we think it's a low risk. And so right now, colonoscopy is considered a relatively low risk. Upper endoscopy, so EGDs, where they're looking into the stomach, that's considered a higher risk procedure because obviously the potential for droplets and coughing and things like that are much higher. So that's considered a high risk procedure. But colonoscopy right now is considered kind of a moderate risk um, at worst. And so we've really gotten back into doing colonoscopies now for patients, even in the current setting. For a while there, we weren't doing it at all because we didn't really know. And so currently during this screening, during this time, especially as things are ramping back up, really the recommendations haven't changed. Like it's not like with COVID, all of a sudden your risk factors have changed. They haven't. And so the standard recommendation is to go back to whatever screening was expected of you based on your personal and family risk. And so, um, so you should still be able to proceed with that, but you may have to jump through some hoops. And so what has changed is that <clears throat> we, when we're doing these procedures, much more frequently are wearing those N95 masks and shields. Now we already wore protective stuff because obviously we didn't get poop on us, but we're, we're kind of doing even higher risk stuff to minimize the likelihood of getting it. It doesn't change anything for you as a patient, but it does for us as the providers um, just to try to make sure that we're being safe. And we have access to that protective equipment, so that's not a problem. And then uh, should 
<clears throat> sometimes we are asking people to get COVID tests beforehand. That's much more frequent. And having gone through the test myself, it's not particularly pleasant. Um, we kind of joke about it being a brain biopsy. It is not fun. And so I certainly understand if there are patients who are not interested in getting that testing beforehand. It's not mandatory, but we do recommend it um, to try to make sure that we're keeping everyone as low risk as possible. Um, so that's really the only thing that's changed. Not all institutions are recommending or requiring that though. So it, there's not been uh, kind of like we've seen with much of this, there's not been governmental requirements across all states and across uh, the entire country. It's really been kind of institution to institution how they've done it. So it, at Barnes Jewish Hospital, Barnes West County, at Siteman South, uh, we are trying to get people tested for colonoscopies, uh, for COVID, for prior to colonoscopies, but I have done it on patients who haven't been able to just because of their own requirements, and we've gone ahead and done the colonoscopies anyway. So, so that's pretty much it. I'll go through my summary. So uh, obviously colorectal cancer is a common condition and it's easy to diagnose, but let's prevent it in the first place. So uh, surgery is the definitive treatment. There are other options with chemotherapy and radiation, but ideally um, let's prevent these from happening so we don't have to go through any of these treatments. As I hopefully have effectively underscored to you, screening and prevention are effective and they save lives. And so we want to make sure we keep doing it. And while, I, as I mentioned, each center is doing things differently during COVID, um, uh, you can still get screened. So we are still doing all the screening. Um, and so whether you're getting stool samples or you're getting colonoscopies or whatever, all of that is still going on now. Uh, you just have to be careful about it. And so with that, I'll stop. I'm one minute shy, but uh, uh, see if there's any questions uh, that I can answer. Thank you so much, Paul. I think it's reassuring to a lot of people to, you know, see the safety precautions in place as, as people start to go back for colonoscopy and other screening. Yeah, they will ask people all the questions that we're asking anyone who's coming into the hospital about, have you been exposed? Do you have any symptoms? They'll check your temperature. So they usually do those questions both before, once you get scheduled, as well as the day or so before, as well as when you come in. So there's more questions you got to answer, but I think we've all kind of learned we're having to adjust everything about our lives right now related to this. And especially as we're seeing the numbers start to go back up again, um, as folks are relaxing, we all need to stay vigilant and careful. Yeah. Any other questions from the group? I think I'm looking through the chat and it looks like I think I hit all the questions there. So certainly happy to answer any others. Well, I do have one question. I know that some um, doctor's offices and maybe some other medical facilities are um, charging an extra charge, being that you have to double up on the PPEs now. Um, is that the case for the hospital as well? Because you don't want the patient to be surprised, you know, if they got a bill or anything. So. That's a great question. I have not, I hadn't actually heard that. Um, and I certainly have not seen that at our institution. So, um, cause the reality is, is, um, you know, we're all just trying to protect each other. And so we want to protect the patients. We want to protect all of the healthcare workers, um, and all of the staff who are in the hospitals. And so the institution has provided us all with appropriate PPE. And then we have had patients who've shown up who have, don't have masks, that we do require masks in the hospital for everyone, um, that I know that they've provided that. I have not seen anyone be charged to use those. And then certainly for us, I've not seen those um, costs passed on to the patients. Um, uh, so I, I'm not aware of that. Marilyn, it's a great question, but I've, I've not had, and I've not had any of my patients say, hey, what's this bill you know, for $20 for a mask that you wore? So mm -hmm. at least here at our institution, that, that has not been passed on. So to my knowledge at all the Siteman Cancer Centers, at all the um, Barnes Jewish and, uh, uh, and Christian Hospital Northeast and all the various different um, BJC hospitals across the network, I have not, I've not heard that. Well, if there's other questions, people can pass them on to uh, PCAT or Marilyn or myself, and we'll get some answers. But thank you for your time today. For Paul. sure. Um, things are busy for a lot of people, and we really appreciate 
um, you're taking time to do this today. Absolutely. Thanks for everyone coming on to Zoom and listening in and participating. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great Thank day, you. everybody. You too. Be safe. All right. Thank you.